second day of your international seminar. No? I'm very happy to be part of this deliberations, which basically try to investigate beyond the written word and also the frontiers of English literature. I'm extremely grateful to the Department of English Science and English College, Alba, and also to um, uh, Sri uh, Shankara College Kaladi for extending this invitation towards me uh, and allowing me to be here. I think I uh, wanted to be with uh, one of the seminars last year and I remember talking to Dr. Vini about that but uh, unfortunately I couldn't turn up at that. But she said one word, uh, definitely come. So somehow uh, after one year maybe this has materialized. Um, so beyond the written word there are certain things that happen. So, uh, but then uh, Especially in uh, being part of this uh, gathering, I would like to place on record my gratitude to the Principal Professor Dr. Menon and uh, Principal Dr. Preeti and also all teachers of both the departments, uh, both the HODs, Dr. Menon sir and uh, Dr. Mini, and also the coordinators, Dr. Saumi, uh, Sudhi, Madam Manu sir and all other friends, Dr. Lima and all. Um, so, uh, I thought I could see some of these, but uh, maybe they're all busy, uh, they're on some fields. Um, so it's uh, very happy uh, to be, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, don't worry, I won't take, uh, I won't go beyond 12.30 because I have a train to catch at 1 o'clock. So I can't be late. Um, so I know that uh, sometimes uh, this is a very difficult exercise, but um, specific choice of Edward Saidi at this particular event has been very important. So I'd like to just uh, rush through uh, introductory remarks on some of his key texts and its relevance for the current times. Uh, and I understand that there are students and professors, scholars and teachers here. So uh, we will just uh, be going through some of his key texts uh, very fast. Um, it has been uh, 20 years uh, since um, Said has passed away from 1935 to 2003. And uh, Edward Said's legacy has to be revisited at this particular juncture uh, in the context of the contemporary events that are happening around us. So I would like to start uh, with this uh, very uh, phenomenal book, uh, the 1978 book, Orientalism, which inaugurated a paradigm shift in uh, post-colonial political practices. And uh, actually the discursive world of the phenomenon of Orientalism tried to make a difference between the uh, you and me between the East and the West, an ontological and epistemological difference. Uh, but it was not just an academic discourse, it was something, a corporate institution that enabled the West to have authority over the Orient. So uh, the, all the kinds of binaries that were basically created, like near, far, known, unknown, in, visited, unvisited, conquered, unconquered, familiar, noble, watcher, watched, etc. Uh, were all parts of these binaries that were created uh, as part of Orientalism. Now, uh, I uh, basically have a doubt whether many of us have really read this book in complete. At least the introduction we must have been familiar. Uh, but I would suggest that every research scholar should read this one book of Said because it will teach you how to arrange your chapters for PhD. So, uh, this will be a very practically good exercise to just read through how uh, Said arranges his chapters. So this has been a very good methodological exercise. We uh, had in MG University um, a little of Edward Said in the UG and PG and all. Uh, but I think we should have more of Said at this particular particular juncture. Uh, now, uh, this is the second book that I am just uh, trying to bring focus, that is Culture and Imperialism. We have essays from this which we study in our syllabus. But this 1993 book uh, was trying to talk about the struggle over geography, where Syed was basically trying to call for a more nuanced reading of the works of art, especially the novel, where you have to pay attention to national, international, and historical context instead of just focusing on their internal coherence. So why Edward Said is important is because instead of just looking into the internal coherences of text, all kinds of uh, new critical um, paradigms, one should really move out of the text, so beyond the, the written word, into the historical, national, and international context. So you have a lot of examples from this book 
which try to talk about uh, Western novels, you know, English literature, uh, English novels basically, which try to create a very big uh, balance test that was helpful for the empire. So we have a lot of uh, texts like, uh, you know, Land Street Park, for example, uh, which would basically try to, um, we, uh, we put it in syllabus without understanding that maybe the trans would not have been possible without the slave trade, sugar, and the colonial planter class. So uh, this slave trade, which was abolished only in the 1830s, was the reason for why you had a metropolitan center of London existing and creating a wealthy cluster there. Uh, but in this text, um, so I could basically try to talk of one more thing, that is, uh, how do you look at uh, transient individuals? And for example, how do you look at servants? How do you look at working class people? How do you look at migrant laborers? And how do they contribute to the uh, main uh, upper class uh, British society? So Saiko articulates something called the contrapuntal reading, which he basically tries to take from music, or which is a metaphor for music. And what he tried to do was to change your focus from the center to the margins. But in fact, he was basically trying to peripheralize uh, the center rather than bringing the margins to the center. So how do you, um, how do you contest a center using the margin? Now, uh, one of his basic uh, arguments would be, rather than what to read, how to read. And uh, Mary Louis Pratt would call a science methodology as a chronology, where you try to read the past through the present. So these texts, you know, when you try to bring literature and all, when you look at them as this realms of pleasure, Said would try to talk of the realms of pain behind these realms of pleasure. So uh, he would also basically try to talk as texts as protein things which are tied to circumstances, uh, to politics large and small, and these require attention and criticism. Um, this text uh, covering Islam first appeared in 1981. Uh, maybe many of us are not familiar uh, with this text, but why this text is important is it was uh, Sayyid's argument that uh, said that there was no direct correspondence between Islam and the common Western usage and the enormously varied life that goes on within the world of Islam. The, you, uh, the Western discourse would try to create a very monolithic, very homogeneous kind of Islam and try to denigrate it and demonize it. So, uh, but uh, now this text is a third in the series. The first book is Orientalism, the second book is the question of Palestine and the third book is covering Islam. So unless uh, one has to read all these three books together to understand what uh, Said would try to create as an argument. This book, uh, I find it very interesting. And I, it's actually a 1983 book, but, but it contains essays. Uh, in fact, Said's strong point was essay, um, which many of us really don't like to read in class. Uh, we like poetry, we like short stories. When essays come, Say, okay, someone else. And uh, somebody who teaches one essay will be uh, sometimes um, dedicated to teach that for the maybe 10 years, 12 years. Suppose you teach Derrida structure center, then no one else will ever teach that. You, you suddenly become the expert. So, uh, but this is why you have to go back to say the form of the essay, how, how he writes and how he argues his arguments. Now, uh, this one, uh, why I have uh, put this in a slide is, this tries to show the shift in American literary theory during the late 70s, which receded into something called textuality. So I think you had a session yesterday on. Um, now, when you really receive into textuality with the apostles like Derrida and Foucault and all, uh, Said was not happy with the kind of hermetically sealed interpretations and airy abstractions that were completely associated with textuality per se. Now, if you look at textuality in some other way, fine, but if you're talking of a kind of sealed experience, Said was definitely against it. So one of sometimes you ask a very crude question, what is the use of reading Derrida when blood enters the living room? So how does Derrida help you when blood enters the living room? So this is one question, uh, this, but the yeah, answer is not that. Those questions like they wrong. Uh, how do you address this question? Uh, Derrida is useful because you help, uh, he helped us in founding certain kind of decentral discourses, which became anti-foundation. So uh, all kinds of decentral discourses, definitely fine. But if they are only area abstractions, that is where Said 
as a problem with it. Now, when Oracle sir came out, Sai was first called as a Foucault team. Uh, and then Sai himself has problems with Foucault. Uh, in Kerala, I told, uh, from what I understood, uh, Sai was hailed as a Marxist first. But slowly, when people started reading him, they understood that he was talking against that also. So, this is a whole problem. Uh, you read only the introduction, you don't read the chapter one. So, um, how does Sai articulate uh, these things? Then, this text, I am bringing it into foreground once again, the question of Palestine. Uh, this was written in 77 and This was one of the first books that put before the Western audience a uh, Palestinian position, a uh, perspective to the Semitic Palestinian uh, problem. Now, every time you speak of something Palestinian, the label that comes accompanying is the label of terrorism. Now, this was the book that pleaded for the case before a world which is terribly biased towards the Zionist position on Israel. Now, um, this is a QA, and uh, just a question for the audience. Um, for those who know him, please don't answer. For those who are hearing him for the first time, what do you think Edward Said? Who do you think Edward Said is? Is he a Muslim? Is he an Arab? Is he a Palestinian? What is his religion? Any idea? He's a Christian. Yeah, what kind of Christian? Uh, ah, okay, fine. Uh, so that is, uh, this was one big problem that, uh, thank you for that. Uh, this was one big problem with his name. You know, Edward Said, uh, one could not, he himself talks about, I think I'll come back to that. Uh, his name was according to him. Well, he had to have a British name at the first half and then his Arab name in the second half. And many of the people uh, listening to the term Sayyid would basically say he is an Arab Muslim. But he basically says a Palestinian Christian. Now, how many of us acknowledge the fact that Palestinian Christian minority uh, out there in that geography? Now, uh, there was a very curious incident. Even Christopher Hitchens, uh, Christopher Norris was translating one of uh, Sayyid's uh, so an article where he translated the name Edward Said, not as Said, but Edward Said when he wrote it in Hebrew. Because both of them, uh, Hebrew and Arabic seems to have similar scripts. Not because he didn't know, but sounding the word Said in Hebrew language would become very discomfort. So this is the politics that sometimes happens. So even you go, when one does not want to articulate a name like Said. Now yesterday I think uh, Said's daughter was talking online. Natsala said. She was telling that my name has become a burden. Uh, she is living in, uh, uh, in the US and there are all parades for uh, Israel's foundation is uh, paraded, but you have nothing for the Palestinians. So Natsala says this also, she has a book, uh, in fact, about her growing up also. Now, this book I, I have just put in for those who want to know the gist of the problem, the politics of this position, 1994, is a collection of science political essays. Now, in World War I, what happened? Britain promises independence to the Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and they say that if you join the Allies against the Ottoman Empire, we'll give Palestine to you. But at the same time, Palestine is being promised to the Zionists also, both of them together. Now, in 1917, when the Balfour Declaration was made, I mean, this is very interesting. If you really read the declaration, and it says these letters actually, uh, this letter, uh, the nation or homeland for Jews were promised in Palestine not the whole of us. So it was supposed to be inside, but the in was written, the word is sometimes elided, and the whole of Palestine was given. Uh, not in the whole, look at this, some of the statistics. You know, 90% population was Arab population, and by 1948, you have only 30% Jewish population despite the continuous Jewish immigration. At the time, the Zionist settlers had only 6% land. But despite this, you know, 55% of Palestine is being uh, allotted and partitioned to you know, Jewish state. So, uh, one of the most complex geographical histories uh, is the Palestinian problem. So, I would urge uh, all of you to really read at least a little of this. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be difficult to make a detail out of that. Um, but then, the question of land is the question of Palestine. That is what I would like to stress. It is not any other question, it is a question of land. Now, you have the Oslo peace process all coming up and Syed was articulating one sentence. Which, um, for which I have taken this, it is impossible to draw lines between people whose cultures, histories, and geographical proximity cannot be separated. Now, this is the problem that you really face. You are trying to separate people who have very intertwined cultures, very intertwined histories, very intertwined geographical proximities. So, um, this task has to be done very carefully. And this is a very beautiful book. I've seen this book, After the Last Sky, Palestinian Lives, 1986, 
this uh, basically it has photographs of Palestinian lives, which is documented in very intimate particulars, and it has a famous uh, epitaph, epigraph as uh, from Mahmoud Darwish's poem, "Where should we go after the last frontiers? Where should the birds fly after the last sky?" So that is a fact. That is from where the title of the book is actually taken. There is a big uh, politics behind this because uh, Palestinian people's photographs were not allowed to be hung in events halls and all. So Zayin and Jain were collaborate and say, okay, then let's do a book. They are not allowing us to put our photographs, then we do a book. So he was a Swiss photographer, actually. Um, I'll come to one of his photographs also later. Now look at this. Uh, Culture and Resistance is another book. Again, this are, these are conversations. Conversations between Said and David Bassani. Now, Said always wanted maps to be published. Because that is one of, very hard to publish a map of Israel Palestine, especially in North America. Uh, you know, uh, Saeed was called the professor of terror. Uh, he had, the FBI had a 238 page file on Saeed himself. His campus, his office was the only one other than the president of Columbia University, which is bulletproof, which had a security bell uh, ringing directly, basically. So, um, he was under constant surveillance. And he does this, he publishes maps, 13 maps in this book, in the Atlantic to tell the story of conquest more eloquently than words can. So maps are very important in this context. So this is a little old, don't uh, just disregard the present, but this gives you a slight uh, idea of what happens. So Jewish settlements are shown in white, uh, the Palestinian land is shown in green. So in 1947, this is what happens. Uh, the partition plan, you have more of the white color coming up, if you see. And 49 to 67, you see suddenly the white uh, land, the Israeli Jewish settlements are increasing. And now these small dots which you have uh, are really what you call Gaza Strip and West Bank. And if you really look at uh, West Bank, it is not a continuous area. It is totally um, broken, uh, centered, centered, centered. From one place to another, you have to go through Israeli checks, checkbook. And the Gaza Strip, if you really look, it's just 41 kilometers long. 5 kilometers wide, 365 square kilometers total. It's a very small area. Uh, I would like to now uh, move into uh, something called uh, Said's interest in music, uh, which is rarely talked about. Um, so this was this was his 1989 Velik Library lectures at the University of California. They were compiled together as musical collaborations. Now, Said basically uh, tries to talk about Western classical music here, and he has three chapters in this book. One is called Performance as an Extreme Occasion, the other one is called On the Transgressive Elements in Music, and Melody Solitude and Affirmation. So, uh, if you look into Said's criticism, basically, you have a lot of musical terms which are being used as critical concepts. So, the first term we mentioned that is counterpuntal, which comes from counterpoint. You have the term polyphony coming up, basically. So, uh, what he basically had to, uh, looking at counterpoint, you know, for the music, it's very interesting. Uh, rather than having a very simple melody line, you have these separate voices which have their own independence, but not just that. They coalesce together and create a different sound when played together or sung together, which will not be possible if they are sung only alone. So, that, that is what he calls some kind of physics, actually, the interference that happens and creates a new reality. So this is what he basically tries to uh, put through. So he was basically a music critic also. He, for 20 years, he was continuously writing uh, in uh, journals about music. Now he would basically uh, try to have a vision of music not as a specialist, but as an amateur. He was basically trying to talk about uh, what should uh, not become a virtuoso. You know, the specialist is somebody who we should be afraid of. The amateur is the only person who can make something called the voyage in. You can, you if you become a specialist, you are cornered. Huh? No, you have to be an amateur to crisscross boundaries. So that is why uh, one word with size always like was transgression. No, in the theological sense of that, the transgression is sin. But transgression is actually crossing over, border crossing. So what you call frontiers and all of your word. This transgression is needed to connect with the other. So that is the whole institution of uh, what Orientalism tried to sell, or existentialism tried to call the other, uh, basically. Unless you make the same called transition, you are not able to connect with the other. 
Now, uh, he would also talk about the concert hall, etc. Uh, but there are certain experiences which I also tries to talk, where he talks about uh, his encounter with Oriental music. Yeah, Oriental music, uh, he talks about a particular uh, singer, Um Kantu, uh, basically. Uh, instead of trying to finish a song, the singer would try to keep on repeating the same phrase again and again. So these variations, uh, expositions of the same theme again and again and again. Now, what was this? So instead of this Western temporality, which was basically uh, always in a hurry to complete any projects, you have to stand and examine the same thing again and again and again. So this is, uh, uh, I'll come to it also. That if you look into a Western sonata form also, you have something called recapitulation. Uh, the first theme is played once again at the end, but this time when you hear it, it becomes so different. Because there is a mid passage which comes in and then suddenly the context changes. So this is uh, music's uh, importance was very um, profound in Said, and he has given us uh, with the uh, yeah. This is another book uh, which he was writing, uh, and he passed away on 25th September 2003. Uh, this is on late style. This is uh, this talks about something called late. Yes. How? Well, this is very interesting. You know why? Somebody comes to class late. You are so worried about that student. Why are you late? But Said was said, late is a, lateness is a very important critical concept. So if students are here from tomorrow onwards, maybe you could say them. Edward Said was talking on late style. So I tried to impact that late style into it. But what is lateness? So if you look at a te text like Tempest for Shakespeare, uh, you call it late place or something like that. But, but the problem is um, Shakespeare tries to create some kind of resolution at the end. And Said then would talk of late style in music and all, not like that. It was unresolved contradictions. So there are certain things you should not be in a hurry to say, put a whole stop and end it. There are unresolved. Now, this actually happens when a musician and a writer and an artist is actually faced with a fear of death, which comes in Beethoven basically, which comes in Adorno basically, and which also comes in Said. Uh, he was diagnosed with leukemia, and suddenly then this book starts happening. This also happens when he starts writing this autobiographical piece out of place. So, bibliotherapy as you try to call it. But music for him is also, was also therapy, basically. So, the death of the artist. Uh, today you have new fields for uh, death studies, funeral studies, uh, essay, look up something called thanatology. Uh, so, death thanatology. Uh, so, death is becoming a very important uh, subject. But the death of the artist gets into uh, the works or the this is a very uh, huge book, actually. If you get a chance to get it, please buy this book. Uh, it has uh, 45 essays on music uh, written by Said from 1983 to 2003 when he served as a music critic. Now, uh, the, the forward of this book is written by Daniel Dardenboy, uh, which we will come to him later. Uh, but he is, says that Said is one of those rare people who saw connections between different and seemingly disparate Discipline. So, to cross over the frontiers, parallels between ideas, topics, cultures, etc. Now, in this book, he has an essay called Feminism and Music. One of the very rare essays he's written. Um, Said is criticized for never talking about the gender question. Uh, but there is a small essay in this called Feminism and Music, where he tries to talk about women composers. And uh, he also has this curious question Is there a feminine kind of music? Uh, because uh, some people say Beethoven is so masculine and Bach is so feminine. So, how does that happen? Uh, but then, what about what happens when the same thing is played by a, a woman, in, a female instrumentalist or a composer? What happens? And he doesn't really give an answer to that actually. So this was one question he uh, very blindly bypassed. Okay. So uh, this is a picture from uh, Jane Moore, uh, where one of very rare pictures where you see Edward Said playing the piano. Uh, he was uh, a pianist of concert level proficiency. Okay, so this is a 1983 picture. He, whenever he felt uh, ill, whenever he felt distressed, he went to the piano uh, to bass. And he was trained in uh, Western classical music from his uh, young days itself. Now this book is uh, a very small book. Uh, this is uh, also a conversation between two very important intellectuals. Uh, they are, it is titled Parallels and Paradoxes, uh, Explorations in Music and Society. Uh, this is a con uh, it shows conversations between Edward Said and Daniel Barenboim. Now, Barenboim is actually an Argentine 
Israeli conductor and Saeed as you know is a Palestinian American. So how can these Israeli and Palestinian come together and converse? This is a very good example. These dialogues show uh, very fervent creative minds engaged in scintillating discussions about art, history, digital politics and life. One, uh, one nice observation which I would like to put forward is what is the role of music education? So we don't have music in our syllabus. We've thrown it out uh, from our uh, you know, regular colleges and put it for for music colleges. So what does music education actually do? Why should music education be? So uh, that is what I think so it It brings a very big balance between your head, your heart, and your stomach. Because if you have to sing, the air has to come from there. Right? So this balance has to be there. And this has to be taught when you're from very young age. But not just that. Uh, how do you look into a symphony orchestra? If you learn to play in an orchestra, you need to learn two things first. First thing is, you should not just play your own notes, you should learn to listen to others. So music teaches you to listen to others. So I am always worried, you know, when teachers give lectures, how musical they are, because this kind of monologues that happen. So what about the small uh, sound that has been happening at the end of the hall, at the, at the corner, uh, that small voice. Uh, in a symphony orchestra, this is very important. That's all as well. Suppose a small instrument we call of both sides to say, oh, this big uh, double bass is there, I'm not going to play my own, I'm even unimportant. Suddenly the whole music taught us. The second thing is, uh, it also teaches you how to live in a democratic society. There are times when you have to lead, and there are times where you have to withdraw. So, certain points you have to take the lead, but certain points you have to withdraw and let others take the lead. So, democratic. A uh, very democratic institution that is our side by side uh, symphony. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I just talk about this and play a video for you. This is a very important institution that I founded. This is called the West Eastern Diamond Orchestra. Uh, this orchestra is very uh, special because it is composed of Israeli and Arab musicians together playing, overcoming the political divide between Israel and Palestine. Uh, this is a way of playfully overcoming this political divide. Now, this uh, orchestra was founded in 1999, and it is one of the world's top orchestras. It had 78 members at the beginning. Uh, founded by Daniel Barenboim, who is a Jew, comes from the Jewish family, and this Edward Said who passed away in 2003. Now, uh, this this was used as a dialogue between two cultures, Israeli and Arab musicians. Uh, this was thought to be an impossible project, but it is still continuing even now to understand each other exceptionally well. This was called as a peace orchestra, uh, but it was not uh, thought to become a political project, it was thought to become a humanistic project. So, some questions are put at the end. How do Israeli and Arab musicians get along with each other? So, what happens when they come together? How does the orchestra work as a team? What role music can play in today's world? For Darren Boyd, the answer is clear. Music is an art form that overcomes divides and which people and in which people from hostile nations can create something together. Well, this is just um, eight of those members they are part of, and this is a program actually, equally in music. And uh, as concert master is Michael Darren Boy. And uh, the United Nations uh, had designated this orchestra in 2016 as a global advocate for cultural understanding. Uh, when people listen to each other, both musically and in all other ways, great results can be achieved. Uh, let me see whether I can play this.
who knows how far we will go and who is not. So, uh, that is Edward Said and uh, Daniel Baron Boy. Uh, just play one more piece for you. So uh, we now move on to uh, another text. Uh, this is his uh, memoir uh, titled Out of Place, 1999, which recounts the story of his boyhood in detail. You used to have one chapter from this in the UG syllabus earlier. Uh, interestingly, the title itself shows uh, the predicament that Said and people like him had to face. The paradoxes of identity that he had to traverse through the early years of his life. The oddity of his English name, Edward, yoked to the unmistakably Arabic side. Now, um, this is a um, largely uh, widely read book of Said. It actually combines his lectures, uh, the BBC lectures in 1993, where he tries to talk of the role of the intellectual. And one first thing is to speak truth to power. So, uh, the intellectual is not like a Robinson Crusoe who tries to colonize this tiny island, but more like a Marco Polo who travels constantly with a sense of the marvelous and remains a professional guest, not a freeloader, conqueror, or raider. And uh, uh, as I tried to tell you, whenever he tried to remark on the Middle East and Palestinian Israeli relationships, uh, the FBI had 238 pages fired on him in his office. Uh, bullet proof and plus a strike to campus security. Now, this is also a very important uh, book which has uh, more than 46 essays. So, at least now you count, if you count no, how many essays you've written <laughs> throughout this. But let me tell you, I'm only putting less than half of the works on that side as well. There was one book um, because you have maybe into 100 slides if you draw, <laughs> if you put each book. So, this much this man has written, and you don't have somebody writing this much these days, maybe. Um, now, on varied topics, but uh, the concept of exile was what was very important. When I tried to also talk of Eric Orbach's Mimesis, uh, which interestingly was written when he was exiled in, into Istanbul, and he was talking of the representations of reality in Western literature sitting in the Orient. Uh, so sometimes in exile is good for a very uh, creative purpose in that sense. But uh, Said, uh, when he went to America, he also faced a very different decision. So the question is, uh, isn't there a difference between a forced exile and your own uh, planned immigration? So how do you look at this concept? So uh, because he was part of the Western Academy, all kinds of post-colonial privileging questions were there. You are sitting there and talking of these people. But uh, I think, uh, of course, as theoretical, you may you can put all those arguments. But the contribution of Sai is so immense that one should not ignore. So this, uh, that is this. Um, Poem by Amesis as Notebook of a Return to the Native Land, which states a vision of integration, which is what I would like to uh, put forward. So I would always talk of integration. No race possesses a monopoly of beauty, of intelligence, of force, and there is a place for all at the rendezvous of victory. So, this is uh, the same question, Palestinian question, if you really ask, what is the future? Uh, so I would basically talk of a joint future when we listen together and sit together. And maybe about, he was actually in two positions. First, he talked of the one nation theory. Then he 
we had to submit to in 1988 the two nation theory because of the uh, peace talks and all that came after the Indian Father Basic came. But then later they said this is wrong. You cannot separate them into two different people. You have to make them together. Uh, you have to bring them together. Which is what is a. Uh, so I would also like to point out one thing, you know. Uh, the description of uh, Palestinians by Israeli uh, press and uh, diplomacy in uh, Australia and all, basically, you know, they don't even uh, give credibility to the existence of Palestinians as humans. They either call them as cockroaches or vermin or tool for a tool like bees. And the recent comment made by the Israeli foreign minister was uh, after October 7 was uh, we are fighting human animals. It, you know, this, this comment it gives you legitimacy to do all these things. That's the whole problem. So this is not a new thing that's what I'm trying to do. 1948 uh, onwards, this kind of uh, uh, denigration has been continuous uh, in terms of vocabulary. So that is why the written word, the spoken word, all becomes very uh, powerful. One word, one adjective is a reason, uh, a legitimacy to all the crimes that you commit. And this, this is a, you know, uh, it's a site actually trying to to throw a stone at the Israeli border. Um, uh, if you look at it, um, maybe now we don't understand how serious this became because he was suddenly talked as the professor of violence and uh, he had to face a lot of death threats. But actually what really happened is when he went to visit Lebanon and a lot of people when the border was open, simply throwing pepper. So he just took a pepper and threw. That was actually what really happened. But this was photographed and this became a very iconic moment and he was um, celebrated as, of course, uh, resistance leader, but he also has to pay uh, death threats because of the small act. Um, yeah. um, then we have just come to Rashtra uh, at the States. Um, this is four days old actually. Uh, this is not the exact count now. Uh, but then uh, if you look at this, you know, at least 29,000 people have been killed, but uh, an angel of 68, 70,000 people, Palestinians have been injured. There, are, there, are, uh, there is a statistic which is missing here which I would like to point out. The number of people who are under the rubble, you know, 7,000, 8,000 people, that is the statistics. No, that doesn't happen. Um, now, look at this. No, um, this is an interactive Gaza map, which was issued by the IDF. It splits this whole strip into hundreds of zones. And the idea from December 1, 2023 said it will be used to notify Palestinian civilians of the active combat zone. So they will tell you which zone has combat, which zone is safe, you can go. Uh, but the interesting thing was, you know how this was given? This was given by, uh, I'll show you the next slide. Uh, if you look down, this was actually given by a QR code. Uh, there is no electricity there. So there is no internet there. So you have to scan the QR code and then understand which is the zone that is safe and then go. Now, uh, now, why I put this is, you have 1.1 million people who left from northern Gaza. So you can see there's four divisions of Gaza, so basically north Gaza, then uh, you have Sterel, Bala, Khan, Yunus, and Rafa. Now where all these people are in uh, the Rafa portion, basically. And uh, in fact, uh, they've been cornered in this. Uh, Gaza is told to be the world's largest open air prison. Uh, the largest unemployment rates, people have no work, no job. Um, no food. They were. They have been driving on subsistence diets. You know, 16 years. Um, this one, you know, as 15 February, the number of IDPs, internally displaced persons, were 1.7 million. Uh, over 75 percent of the population have been displaced. So they had to take run from the northern end to the southern end. And uh, this is a crime against humanity and violation. And this has been a very large humanitarian crisis that we're facing. And it is the largest displacement of Palestinians in the past 75 years. And it is described as the second Nakba. In 1948, the first displacement disposition took place was told as the first Nakba. And uh, 7 lakhs to 8 lakh people were displaced. But now look, you have 1.7 to 2.2. In the SMA cycle, actually 2.2. So maybe uh, 2 million people are being displaced. Um, but I would like to draw your attention to the last paragraph. If you have missed this piece of news, Please go back, check Wikipedia, that's my suggestion. Uh, this first evacuation order on 13th October 2023 was described as genocidal by Adila Hassim SC in a speech to the International Court of Justice in January 2024. There is a case pending in the International Court of Justice. It is South Africa versus Israel. So South Africa is the first country which has called this uh, Israel's crime as genocide. And they have taken it to the International Court of Justice. Uh, South Africa's whole transcript 82 pages is available free on the Wikipedia. Please take a look at it. The argument.
difference uh, because this comes under something called the application of the convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide in the Gaza Strip. So this, uh, um, this case is there pending. Um, there. And how does um, the situation of Palestinians not to become genocide is what Israel is trying to argue. Uh, in the broader context of Israel towards Palestinians, you know, three important things you have to do. It has been a 75 year apartheid. It has been a 56 year occupation. It has been a 16 year blockade of the strip. So this is the real situation of these people. Okay, this is open to the audience. Uh, this represents a very famous, this is not the exact painting, this is a famous war painting uh, which is merged into the Palestinian crisis. Which is this war painting? Gornica. Yeah, correct. Gornica, uh, any idea which year? Gornica, which year? Gornica. Just a rough. Gornica. Which word? I think that is actually, uh, but uh, which country is Gornica? Yeah, Spain, correct. That is it. Now, why is this is important? The first Western country to openly say uh, to state against uh, Israel genocide in Palestine was Spain. And this took place on a, oh, December 2023. And why should a Western country like Spain stand with Palestine? Any idea? But what was the whole experience of Gurnika? Ah, okay, who's paying? Yeah, this is for students. Teachers, please forgive me because they did some work. Otherwise, they do. Okay, who's painting is Gurnika? Now open to all. This is why we should read side. Not those reading should take this. Ah, Gurnika is a painting, but. Yeah, Picasso. Correct. Now, 1937, April 26, what really happened? And the market was actually bombed. What is the purpose of the bombing is also more interesting. The very same square where this bombing took place, this uh, demonstration has been taking place. So, look at this. Uh, color of the flags, not issue. Humans were forming this color, actually. Okay. So, uh, next slide is winding up. Uh, any idea who this person is? Uh, why I put this? Because Kerala Media Academy gave an award as a media person of the year award to this person. He is called Vahil Al Dawood. Uh, his wife, his two children, and grandchild were killed in the bombing of Gaza by Israel. He is a journalist. He is still continuing to report even after that. It's a uh, once and just killed one month back. So he lost his complete family and he is still continuing to report. Uh, this is a famous point that has come up. Rifat uh, Alawi. I'll just read that point. If I must die, you must live. To tell my story, to sell my things. To buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a place, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment, an angel is there. Bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a story. Any idea who this poet is? He's an English professor, only 44 years old. He was killed in the Israeli airstrike in December. Okay. This particular poem has been translated into 40 languages so far. It has been translated into Malayalam also uh, by Dr. Farooq of Muslim College. So, at least some of you must have read it. Uh, it is available when last month it came out. So, this, uh, even, see, even if you be a professor of English literature, uh, the air strike will not spare you. Okay, so <laughs> this is uh, this is where art stands. Okay, I think this point will continue. We should put it in literature and human rights. You know, basically. Uh, then uh, this is I'm concluding with this slide from Richard Falk uh, gave an Edward Said Memorial lecture in our but after the uh, October 7. And uh, this is very st stating Edward Said's contribution. Why you should be revisiting his legacy. Um, Edward came to possess one of the few keys that if properly turned decades ago might have avoided much of the ensuing measuring for both peoples, allowing Jews and Arabs, despite their historic missteps, to learn to live together peacefully and justly rather than engage in what has become a cover death deaths. Edward's humanistic vision of what should and could have been now seems as remote as the most distant star in the galaxy. Now, uh, 20 years back, if uh, Edward said suggestions were followed 20 or 30 years back. Maybe the prices would not have uh, exaggerated so much.
much. So I'd like to conclude with these words. In a world where the ideals of truth, peace, compassion, and harmonious justice seem to be led and threatened towards extinction as the days roll by, science vision must essentially offer us hope and prosperity. It challenges us to go forward just as Ahim says, holding hand in hand, building new bridges, crossing all barriers, climbing all styles, breaking all fences, walking distant miles, eagerly awaiting the break of dawn and the spread of sunshine. So uh, thank you for your patient listening. And I would also like to place on record that to Dr. Anjana Shankar for her presence here. I'm very happy to see her. Um, so thank you once again, Karmina, Dr. Sao, and Dr.